Chapter 1. Moscow Airport. February 13, 2026. 9 p.m. local time. The big Aeroflot Boeing 777 had begun its taxi. In the back, the 350 passengers had all started to settle in for the long flight to Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada. The flight only ran once every two weeks, so Tatiana was delighted that she and her six-year-old son Vladimir had made it onto the aircraft. They were on their way to visit Vladimir's older brother Andre, who at 16 was playing in the Western Hockey League in Canada, in order to give him his best chance at playing in the NHL one day. Tatiana and her family lived about two hours to the southwest of Moscow. Her older son had been identified early in his hockey career as one having great potential. He played at the highest level that he could as he grew, always the top scorer in his league, which had teams that played all over the country. At 15, the Canadian Western Hockey League's Brandon Wheat Kings had come to call, but they weren't able to generate the exceptional status that Andre would have needed to play in the league at 15, so he had to wait till he was 16. Tatiana didn't think this was a bad thing, because it turned out that even at 16, Andre had ended up homesick, and even though she spoke to him almost every other day, in one form or another, he longed for home and for his connection with his family, his language, and even his little brother, Vladimir. Being homesick had an effect at his hockey performance, however, and he was doing what he'd always done by lighting up red lights behind goalies all over Western Canada as he led the scoring in the league and with the Brandon Wheat Kings. Andre's father would have been proud of his oldest boy had he still been alive, but three years prior, as Andre turned 13, what had started as a sore throat manifested its way into a very aggressive form of throat cancer. Nikita had done his best to fight through the terrible disease and pain, but he eventually succumbed to the disease and passed just as his eldest turned 14, leaving a wife and two boys to make their own way in the world without the dominant masculine influence that they'd relied upon until then to get by. As the big aircraft started to taxi, Vladimir, who had the window seat for the night departure, kept grabbing his mother's arm and pointing out the window. Look, Mama, there's a lot of airplanes and that one is so close to us, he exclaimed. Tatiana explained to her bewildered child that Moscow was a very busy airport and that there were a lot of airplanes using the airport. It was evident outside that the minus 38 degrees Celsius temperature was making operations for the ground crew and air crew difficult. Steam rose from all the functioning ground support equipment, and when workers were finished loading baggage from conveyors, they quickly scurried to the warmth of booths set up around the base of the airport to house workers from the harsh environment. Throughout the large aircraft, everyone was busy trying to get as comfortable as possible for the 10-hour flight to Winnipeg. The flight was pretty much directly over the North Pole on what pilots referred to as a Great Circle Route, or a direct route to the destination. Although the distance to Winnipeg on the direct routing was just over 4,100 nautical miles, it was well within the capability of the 777 extended range that had a range of over 7,000 nautical miles. The flight would be over some of the harshest terrain in the world, but inside the cabin, Tatiana and her fellow travelers would remain cocooned in environmentally controlled and comfortable surroundings. Vladimir grabbed his mother's arm again as the 777 turned onto the taxiway at the end of the runway. Look, Mama, that airplane, and it's really close. This time, Tatiana stole a glance out her son's window on the port side of the aircraft and was surprised to see a different type of an aircraft relatively close to her aircraft. It didn't look like one of the new modern airliners that Aeroflot had been purchasing for the last number of years, but more of a throwback to the era when Russia tried to rule the world with its air forces and ground forces. Oh well. Maybe the military was conducting night operations in and around Moscow. It was possible given the strategic importance of the area, especially since the newest drone strikes from forces in the Ukraine had hit closer to home than ever before. When would the war with the Ukraine stop, Tatiana lamented. Just then, from the flight deck, Good evening, this is your captain. We have quite a bit of a headwind this evening, and so the flight is expected to take about an extra hour to conduct. The weather in Winnipeg is the same as here, clear and cold, with a temperature of minus 35 degrees Celsius. Sit back and enjoy the flight. We are next for takeoff. So far, the flight was going exactly as Tatiana had hoped and expected. An IL-76, number two for takeoff. The Aleutian 76 was a diversely purposeful Russian transport aircraft. Although not particularly fast, 
and not able to carry out long-range operations with heavy cargo loads if the loads were kept to a minimum and the speed was pushed. The IL-76 was quite a capable aircraft. If you loaded the aircraft with 36 combat troops, each weighing in at 250 pounds, then your cargo load was only 9,000 pounds and you could easily transit for close to 5,000 nautical miles at close to Mach 0.85. Now Mach 0.85 was slower than a Boeing 777 normal operating cruise of 0 0.90, but that difference over the course of 10 hours would account for about an hour's delay in a flight plan from Moscow to Winnipeg. If you took that IL-76 and flew it in tight formation immediately below and behind the 777 and didn't turn on the transponder on the IL-76, then modern air traffic control radar, and for that matter military radar, wouldn't be able to break out the formation and understand that there were actually two aircraft flying very close together as opposed to one aircraft flying on its own flight plan. It was about two hours into the flight, and Vladimir was having trouble settling for the remaining flight to Winnipeg. He once again grabbed his mother's arm and said, I think that airplane is still next to us, Mama. Tatiana looked out the window and saw nothing. You're being ridiculous now, Vlad. We're very high in the sky and on our way to Winnipeg to see your brother. Settle down and go to sleep. Aboard the IL-76, the pilots had ensured that all of the external lighting was off. The cockpit lights had been turned off in case someone in the 777 happened to glance out the window at an inappropriate time, and the pilots in the 76 used night vision goggles to station keep. They were pushing their aircraft to the maximum speed in order to keep up with the 777, but the element of surprise would be worth it. About seven hours into the trip, Aeroflot 243 was directed to call Edmonton Centre and then Winnipeg Centre for Central Canada. They checked in as the flights had countless times before. Two hours later, and about an hour north of the airport of Winnipeg, Manitoba, the Aeroflot flight was asked to squawk ident. This meant that the air traffic control unit wanted the Aeroflot flight to hit a button on their control panel which would electronically identify them to air traffic control. The Aeroflot pilots complied. An ATC advised that Aeroflot 243, you are radar identified at flight level 330. Say your type of approach requested for Winnipeg, sir. Aeroflot 243, we are requesting the ILS onto runway 36. But soon after, Winnipeg Aeroflot 243, request. Go ahead. Aeroflot 243, request deviation right of course for turbulence. Uh, how far to the south are you expecting, Aeroflot? The controller asked. It was unusual to have turbulence on such a cold night, but maybe they were hitting the jet stream right at a bad point. After all, they were at flight level 330, or 33,000 feet, which was quite a bit below where they normally entered. On this flight path, they normally arrived in the high 30s or even low 40s. Must be particularly heavy this evening with passengers and cargo. Uh, we think uh, about 50 to 75 miles to the south of the track will work for us, was the reply. Winnipeg responded, Aeroflot, deviations to the south of track at your discretion. Maintain flight level 330. Advise proceeding direct Winnipeg. Aeroflot 243, deviations to the south at our discretion at flight level 330 will advise turning direct to Winnipeg. And with that, the 777 with the IL-76 in tow turned toward their real target of Shiloh, Manitoba. The 777 crew had one extra waypoint in their system tonight. Each Aeroflot crew member was an ex-military member, and so, when they'd been briefed on the plan, it was easy for them to fall back into their Air Force roles. The big 777 turned slightly to the right to put Shiloh, Manitoba on the nose. In the IL-76, the warning lights in the back of the aircraft went to red. The agreement was the red light would advise the troops that the final run-in had begun. The yellow light would signal the start of the slowdown and the preparation to open the cargo door, and the green light would signal the actual drop point for the troops. The troops in the back of the IL-76 were their own special breed of Russian special forces, the Spetsnaz. They were similar to the special forces of other nations and as such were able to conduct nighttime parachute jumps into enemy territory. Tonight's jump was something special. Even though there were 36 troops on board the IL-76, the plan was for 18 to exit the aircraft over Shiloh and for 18 to stay with the aircraft as it left and continued onward to Winnipeg, while delaying as much as possible airborne before landing. The IL-76 was to minimize time on the ground in Winnipeg, limiting exposure to Canadian authorities and hence lowering the threat to the completion of the mission. 
The 18 troops who would jump would conduct a halo jump, otherwise known as a high-altitude, low-opening parachute jump. It meant that the troops would all be on oxygen when the door opened, as they'd be 5,000 feet higher than the peak of Mount Everest. And then the 18 designated to carry out the attack on Shiloh would jump out the back of the aircraft. In order to minimize the chance of detection and to speed everything up, they would conduct a freefall until they were just 4,000 feet above ground level before they opened their black parachutes. All of the members of the two teams of nine jumping, Alpha and Bravo sections were dressed in black to camouflage them during the night descent. Not only black clothing, but with black cam stick on their faces, black oxygen masks, black helmets, and black jumpsuits and boots. Their weapons were strapped to their bodies, and each soldier carried enough rounds in their backpack to start a small war by themselves. The troops remaining on board were wearing the exact opposite and were totally clad in white for operations at the Winnipeg airport. The troops making the drop into Shiloh had two weapons. The first was the normally silenced attack weapon carrying 7.62 millimeter ammunition in case a firefight broke out. The second was an especially developed air rifle with a range of 100 meters that dealt out a sedative dart. The sedative was fast acting and would put a 200 pound individual out of commission for about four hours. It was like the darts used on big game in Africa. The intended targets would have a heck of a bruise and a bit of a hangover, but they'd be alive upon waking after being nailed with the darts. The targets were the legs or the buttocks, ideally. At the designated spot, the IL-76 began to slow. The yellow light turned on, and the 777 advised center that they were once again able to turn direct towards Winnipeg. Aeroflot 243 was then cleared for a normal approach to runway 36 in Winnipeg and carried out a normal approach and landing, while the IL-76 developed separation by slowing for the intended parachute drop. When the 777 landed, it taxied to the terminal and disgorged its passengers, and exhausted Tatiana and Vladimir amongst them to the waiting people in the terminal. Tatiana could see outside that it was another frozen wasteland. It was 11 p.m. in Winnipeg on a cold Friday the 13th night.